Gate, War of Two Worlds Part 2. V21, Chapter 246 The Archangel. Written by P. W. O. Falcon. Jezreel Valley, Israel. Date, August 19, 2026. Speeding through the Levant Desert inside a sandcat, Sharp has been quiet as he listened to Rory and Fredo Donnelly conversation about history and a quick lesson regarding the Bible, and the Age of Heroes. Among them are their escorts, the Yahalem, and Israel Combat Engineers Special Forces. In addition, with them are Fredo Donnelly staff, made up of historians and archaeologists. Feeling a small hand placed on his arm, he saw Rory. You have been quiet for three hours. Everything okay? Just thinking, Sharp said as the jeep bounced. What do you think of the Middle East so far? Very different than I expected, Rory replied. I can just feel the energy all around me. Feel what? The blood. The sand below us has been soaked with so much blood over the multiple millennia. All the battles, campaigns, and duels. Nations. Empires. All fighting here for one reason or another. The wealth of tales by soldiers who once marched on these lands would be mind-blowing. I wish I could have been there to witness them. I think you mean to be part of, Sharp corrected. Well, yeah. Sharp shook his head at her perspective, finding it humorous. Imagining this short petite girl fighting alongside the warriors of great, like Hercules, Alexander, Achilles, and more. He had to agree, witnessing all that history would be amazing. How much longer until we find the site? We should have been there by now if we weren't going so slow, Fredo Donnelly said. We have to be careful, Horel said. Rebel factions from Syria like to hide out down here. There are snipers and cells all over the place. I thought your Abraham Accords ended the fighting in the region? Rory asked. You cannot end 7,000 years of wars with an accord, Horel said. What that did was normalized relations between nations. Not rogue groups. It was a positive first step, Sharp added. Still, a long way to go through. For everyone. The country up north entered a civil war about a decade ago, Sharp added. It has never recovered and has become a failed state. It does not help that the remains of the country are in the sights of much geopolitical competition between a dozen nations. Wow, same shit, a different planet, Rory mumbled. As the six-vehicle convoy headed to Armageddon, an antimaterial sniper round impacted the hood of the lead sandcat. The vehicle slid to the side and stopped. The rest of the convoy stopped, and everyone urgently got out as fast as they could, getting behind them for cover. Once the jeep stopped, limited rifle fire opened against them. Rory slid over the hood of the sandcat, laughing. So, this is how it feels? What the hell are you talking about? Horel said. You are in the line of fire. Get back here before you get shot. That would be a dream come true. Sharp turned and told Horel to calm down, that she is fine which confused the Yahalem and civilians. I have been wondering what it would feel like to be shot by something more impactful, Rory answered. So far, I have only experienced being shot by your standard rounds and that was a cakewalk. Facing off with a sniper and higher caliber rounds, that is exciting. Sharp saw the reaction from all the Yahalem and civilians. All had a baffled look regarding a petite girl's reaction to the current situation, and were willing to stand in the line of fire like it was nothing. This is a terrifying position to be in as an unknown sniper with infantry support pinning the ground down. It would not be long before the unknown about of enemy infantry would surround them as the sniper kept them pinned. One good should and someone's head would be blown off. If it was not for the fact that he was used to, Rory, he would have had the same reaction. Jackson, mind if I go find our little friends? Hold on, Sharp said. Based on the opening engagement, I think there are three, maybe four riflemen. Plus, the sniper. I agree, Horel replied. There are probably one or two more up there waiting to see what we will do. This is the plan, Sharp said. Rory, you will flush them out. The rest of us, pick off the infantry. What the hell are you doing? Horel yelled. You are sending a twelve-year-old out there? She will get blown to pieces. Hey! 
Rory angrily said as rifle rounds buzzed past her. As she frustratedly spoke a bullet hit her right shoulder, scaring everyone except Sharp but to everyone's shock. She barely flicked from the shot, caring more about her rant than being shot. I am sick and tired of you Terrans calling me twelve. I am 963 years old. I have been alive longer than most of your nations. And second, time to go hunting. Rory then turned to her wound and watched it heal. Letting out a sadistic laugh, she started to hum before charging against the incoming fire. Hearing another rifle round zip by, she charged forward at great speed. Sharp watched Rory as he shook his head, debating how he gets involved with so many crazy people. He turned to the Yahalam and civilians who all were watching with great confusion and fear. Fear is not being killed by the enemy but fear from not understanding what just happened and how insane this apostle is. What does the world they once knew crashed before them? You guys will get used to it. Now, back into position and engage. Peeking over the hood, Sharp saw most of the enemy weapons fire aiming toward Rory as she quickly run through the open terrain. It seemed like the terrorists realized the seriousness of the threat from her inhuman speed and were desperately trying to kill her. With fighting his fair share of apostles, he fully understands what they are about to save and it will not be pleasant. Seeing the flashes from the enemy barrels, Sharp and the other Yahalam aimed their rifles with one acting as a spotter. One by one, the group took out the enemy terrorists. As the skirmish ended and the sound of wind took hold, Sharp told the professor and his staff to stay next to the sandcat for cover. He and a few other Yahalam head toward the enemy position, rifles at the ready. Rory, report. I got the sniper, Rory said. He was such a nice man. I think he was calling me a demon. I do not know as I could not understand. I was just too much laughing. However, he did ruin my skirt, so I had to kill him. Roger, Sharp replied and then realized everything she said was so normal that he didn't react to it at all. Don't play with your food and regroup on my position. You two are bats hit crazy, Horrell commented. Is this really how things are on Fallmart? This crazy? To Sharp's surprise, answering the question proved harder than he expected. After reflecting on everything he has experienced, he responded, Honestly, this is just another Tuesday for me at this point. Seeing some of the Yahalam walk away in shock, unable to phantom what it was like on Fallmart, all he could do was laugh. Sharp and the Yahalam reached the foxholes the terrorists were hiding at. A total of seven corpses were scattered around. Some with their bodies sliced in half. Each of them checked the bodies, ensuring none were alive, and reported the incident. Rory stopped and looked at the bodies, placing her index finger on her lower lip. As I was slicing off this man's head, I started to wonder. How did they know where we were? Do they know? Are they trying to stop us from our mission or a bad case of luck? Probably not, Horrell said. As I said before, this happens all the time out here. Most likely, someone in Afula saw us leaving in this direction and his buddies laid a trap. And that is it. Rory asked. Are you at war with anyone? That is a far more complex question than you think, Rory, Sharp said. There is no good answer. On paper no, however, some groups act like they are. As we said before, thousands of years of warfare on these lands and everyone has their opinions on the matter. We should get going. Reaching back to the sand cat, Sharp checked on the professor. Before he could ask if the man was okay, expecting the civilian to be freaking out during his first fight fight. All his staff was shaken by the fight fight however, to his surprise, the man was sitting by the tire waiting like he was bored. Is everything okay, Colonel? Fredo Donany asked, noticing Sharp's reaction. Okay with me, but what about you? Sharp said. With no due disrespect, but a bookworm like you would panic after an engagement like that. Oh, yeah, Fredo Donany replied, placing his hand behind his head. I lived in southern Italy most of my life. The threat of the mob hangs over us all the time. While it is true that southern Italy is ruled by the Cosa Nostra and mob violence is common, a part of Sharp did not believe the professor. He has heard stories from other soldiers who were deployed to Italy that said bomb threats were so common the average citizen considered it a normal day. 
however, he couldn't believe living in that environment was equal to what they had just experienced. Right. Get in the sand cat. Making sure everyone was ready to leave, Sharp looked over to Rory. He saw her standing toward the mountain, gazing out. To his confusion, she was speaking. Like she was having an entire conversation with someone, even though no one was there. Short legs. We are rolling out. Rory placed her hands together and bowed before turning toward Sharp with a smile. I think our paths have to divert, for now, Jackson. What the hell are you talking about? This is not the time for games. Trust me, it will only be a short bit. There is something I must do. You go off and finish the mission. Slamming the sandcat door, Sharp headed toward Rory. You know what, you have been acting very funny for a long time now. And that is saying coming from you. You have been hiding something from me and you will tell me what it is now. I am tired of being in the dark about what is going on. There was a moment of silence as the two stared at each other before Rory said, you practiced that speech. Didn't you? Sharp glared at her and said, that is beside the point. I am armed, pissed, and I want answers. Rory raised her hand to calm him. Everything will be okay. You are correct, I have been hiding something from you. I promise I will explain everything after this mission is over. And I mean everything. But right now, I must go. There is someone I must talk to. That makes no sense, Rory. Why can't I know what is going on? Is your reason the same as why Lele had to hide her involvement with Sordin? Something like that, but I say it makes just as much sense as everything else. I will see you soon. Rory jumped away and then ran off into the desert, while Sharp called out to her. Watching Rory run away and knowing that he cannot match her speed, all Sharp could do was take a deep breath. All right, everyone, let's roll out. The group unloaded the destroyed sandcat and the five remaining vehicles took off. Stopping at the nearby hillside, Rory turned to watch the convoy drive off to Armageddon. Good luck against Brad Pitt. Rory placed her hands on her hips and investigated the open valley. Your Great Holiness, can we talk now? Out of thin air, a shadowy figure emerged. The shadow slowly transformed into a man with wings while wearing a white robe. Are you? Rory shakingly spoke as she feels the immense divinity of the winged man. Far surpassing her patron god, Emroy. Yes, I am Saint Michael. Greeting your great holiness, Rory spoke as she kneeled in respect. Aphrodite informed me you wished to speak to me. That is true, Michael said. I have been in communication with the caretakers on both worlds. And please stand up so you can talk with me more freely. There is no need for formality here. I have to admit, this, feels a bit strange, Rory said as she got back onto her feet. I had all these questions I wanted to ask you, but I do not know where to begin. Well, Hardy pretty much summed up what is going on Uwish right now, Michael said. True, Rory said as she realized Michael was probably listening to her all this time. However, she did not explain why all this was happening. And why now? You should have studied the Book of Revelations, Michael cheerfully said. The story is straightforward. The battle between heaven and hell. The world the humans call Uush was marked for hell's domination for all the world's sins. But why Uush? Why my world? The big man considered Uush as one of many sanctuary worlds for his children. That is why you see so many different species there. All coming from their worlds to take shelter there. A heaven? Is that what you mean? They are different. However, you can look at it like that if it helps you. When the universe was young, the big man opened the gate world after world, allowing migrants to join one of these worlds for protection and salvation. Right now, Rory wished that Lele was with her to explain the deeper context. From what she understood, this is an event that happens throughout the stars and Uush is one of many. What happens to the non-sanctuary world? As I said, they are a battleground and dystopias, Michael said. Which is why the big man created the sanctuary worlds. And the gods? All worlds that host his children have what you call gods as their caretakers. All with the intention of maintaining balance, however, as you can see that is not always so. 
Why would the big man allow that? Rory asked. If the gods are his caretakers, how can a god like Zufmut go rogue and try to bring the end times? The price of free will, Michael said. I would expect by now you would fully understand that after your experience with your creation. You might have left physically but you never left emotionally. There was no need to reflect on what was said. Rory knew Michael's meaning, her experience regarding the Empire and Talin. She has considered both a dark spot of her past and has looked to redeem it. I regret everything I have done in the past, Rory stated. I have been trying to move on. You claim that however out of all your sisters and his teammates, no wonder why Sharp trusts you the least, Michael sarcastically remarked. You have proven to be too dishonest compared to your sisters or even Talin. What do you mean I am lying? Rory strongly yelled back before restraining herself. I am speaking the truth with all my heart. You are saying that even the enemies are more honest than me. Michael stared at Rory with a smile. You have always been a loose cannon. Quick to react and relied on others to bail you out. As Rory began to disagree, she remembered all the times Sharp had to save her. A mortal always has to save an immortal. Usually, because of her reckless behavior. You, you are not wrong regarding that but what does it have something to do with this? You just need to be honest with me, Rory, Michael said. Despite all the atrocities Talin has committed at least he is willing to say what he truly felt to me. What did he say to you, great holy one? Rory inquired. I must know. Michael stood there on the cliffside, staring out at the beautiful desert of the Levant. Tell me what you truly feel first and then I will tell you. The truth is when I realized what the empire was turning into, I ran, Rory said. Seeing what Talin had become. I wished. I wanted to change, but it was too late. I was alone and powerless to change so I left the empire and its people behind. But you didn't truly leave. Feeling her blood boil, Rory yelled, but I did leave. Taking a deep breath to calm herself, she reflected on what she just said and gripped her hands. At least, I thought I did. But I guess I am doing it all over again. Is that why you side with the humans of Earth? Well, because they could bring the change I was seeking the first time. They have come so far as a civilization and as a species compared to us. They had the power, maturity, and wisdom to do what we failed to do. With a moment of silence, Rory glanced at the rocky ground. At least, that is what I told everyone. It was easier to trust and mold strangers than to deal with my past. I hoped Sharp and his people would fix everything so when I ascended into the realm of the gods I knew the world would be a better place. That is why you devoted yourself to Sharp and his people, Michael said. In the hope that you can redeem yourself for creating an oppressive kingdom in the first place. However, at the same, your devotion toward Sharp is very much like your devotion to Talin. Taking a deep breath, Rory realized that she had a type. Yes. Much like Talin, Jackson is an idealistic man who always strived for the betterment of everyone. I saw that when he saved Selina and the village. I learned from my past mistakes with Talin. I let him be corrupted by his noble ideology. Due to this, I committed myself to guide him and to the extent his people to not become like Talin as well as the Empire. Your devotion to Sharp which mirrors how you devote to Talin shows that you have yet to move on. What about your people? Even though I left the Empire, I always wish the best for the people, Rory said. When the Americans and NATO came to this world, I often wished to see Talin and my creation destroyed. But a part of me still does not wish to see the painstaking creation that took centuries to take hold to be destroyed. So yes. I have been lying to you and even myself. Rory continued. Every time I face Talin, I refuse to understand why he never sided with me. Wondering why he was so stubborn and refused to listen to reason. But I see now. Deep down inside, I knew that he knew I was lying. Not to him but to myself, to the point that I brought another man to take responsibility for my deeds. If I just took responsibility, things would have been very different. Maybe I would have had the right to be listened. As the archangel listened and was thrilled by the response that the apostle had given. I am glad that you are finally telling yourself the truth. So are you still trying to move on from all of this? 
Yes, Rory said as she reflect on everything that has been said. I will move on by truly making peace with my past mistakes and not repeat it with sharp and to the extent the Terrans. I should have more hope in my creation. Even though the Empire has been a scrounge to this continent for centuries, there are still good people like Pina or Chrysis within it who are willing to change it for the better. I am glad that the Empire becomes the Republic once again. That is good to hear Rory, Michael said. Now that you are truly moving on by being honest with yourself. Now, can you tell me what Talin said to you, Great Holy One? Rory asked. He agrees with what you said. Really? A thick-skulled individual like him gonna agree with what I just said. Well, you think you know him, but it seems you do not know enough. I, Rory pointed to her finger to correct the archangel. However, she realized that was true. While on opposite sides, Sharp and Talin are very similar. Passionate about their beliefs and willing to fight and die for what they believe in. Point taken. But why did you bring this up? Because for you to take the next stage in your journey you must understand that his children are not slaves of his will. They are free to pursue their paths which is why his children, even the gods, fall victim to devil's influence. It takes extraordinary efforts and feats to make people change their minds and it is far harder to do that against the gods, Michael explained. Despite the odds humanity proved itself that they no longer needed to control their lives and futures. After the gods made that decision, an interesting dilemma happened. Humanity still lacked the guidance of the gods which forced our creator to put them in the right direction for a while or else they were going to destroy themselves or end up like the empire. Is that why he unleashed the ten plagues on Egypt, destroying Sodom and Gomorrah and giving Moses the Ten Commandments? Rory asked. Correct, Michael responded. It is also the same reason why he sent Jesus to guide humanity as well. Interesting, Rory said. What I do not understand is why Zufmut is doing all this. Is it to maintain control or is he in disagreement with you? Zufmut fell prey to Lucifer's temptation, Michael said. He and others cannot let go of their direct involvement in mortal life and do not like the involvement of their creator. A new era is starting to unfold and not all seem to be pleased by it. Fascinating, Rory said. Do you think we can win? That is not the question you want to ask. If it was not the question I wanted to ask, then why did I ask it? Michael looked toward the apostle and shook his head with a smirk. You spent too much time around sharp sarcasm does not suit someone of your station. Rory crossed her arms, knowing that the archangel was correct, and her words had different meanings. How do I save the other apostles? That is the question you wanted to ask. The thing is, I have no idea what to do. This has never happened on Uush before. No apostle was ever brainwashed to work for a different god, and I am watching my comrades being turned against me. Explain to me what has happened, Michael said. I thought you were an archangel, Rory said. Would you not already have the answer? I am here answering your questions, am I not? Michael said. Knowledge that is given freely has no reward. Part of free will is attaining the answers you are seeking. Getting the point, Rory apologized and continued. The story began in Rondel. After the defeat of the legendary Summon Demon, a coalition between NATO, Rondel, and Imperial forces stormed the capital of the guilds. During that engagement, three apostles appeared. Mabel Fawn, Apostle of Zufmut. Jasus Fizaris, Apostle of Syphilis. And Envira, Apostle of La. The three apostles had the same eye colors, the demon's dark red. She then explained the other encounters with brainwashed apostles like Martimus Onu. It is clear they are being controlled by an outside force, Michael said. The question is how? Because Zufmut is the one who is working with the demons, I assume that Mabel is the leader of these brainwashed apostles. I assume so. She has been the one who did most of the talking. Rory thought about the question and remembered a detail from the Battle of Rondel. I have known Mabel for many centuries, and I never recalled her being this violent and very righteous. Yes, she had that Ovion Sea hot-headedness, but she would never betray her world for demons even if Zufmut forced her. Recalling her fight with the Apostle, she then realizes something is off about Mabel. Wait, Rory said. 
Her blood sword diva. What about her sword? The blood sword diva can only mind control mortals, but not apostles, Rory explained. It works by siphoning the blood of Mabel. If I recall, Zufmut was controlling. Of all the gods, he was the god that argued with his apostle the most, surprising how people who believe in order are also very authoritarian. That must be why Marbel always stayed to herself. Based on recent events, Zufmut must have manipulated the blood sword to control his apostle and use her to brainwash others. I would say that is a reasonable theory, Michael said. Destroying your friend's weapon should free your fellow apostles. The question is, how? Rory asked. I do not know if you noticed, our weapons are mostly indestructible since they are forged by the Apostle of God of Smith, Duncan. You will find a way. Very helpful, Rory jokingly said. We partly destroyed the Talon axe, so it is possible. However, it will be tough. Mabel would know this weakness and would protect her sword. Plus, all the apostles she brainwashed will be watching her. We are outnumbered. Yes. You are, Michael said. However, you already know. She then bowed, happy for the answers. Thank you for all of your help. I do have one final question. You are going to ask me why? Yes. Why not tell this to Sharp? He is the one who carried this on his shoulders. Or Lele, she is the smartest person I have ever met. Or anyone. I only just tagged along. I and the old man have our reasons regarding them. There was a reason why you were there when the gate opened. As you know, your time is coming to an end as an apostle and you would have joined the gods of Falmart, separating yourself from the mortal realm forever. Worthy of what? Michael said. If events come to pass, you will no longer be worried about leaving your new family or foregoing your emotions as a goddess. But only if you carry out his will. Before Rory could follow up, Michael faded away. Standing in the middle of the desert, confused, she thought and smiled, well, whatever it is at least I will be with everyone till the end. Library of Illurish. As the blue mana particles disperse, Lele saw the darkness of the stone chamber as the light faded. We are here, Freyan said. Follow me. Okay. Lele grabbed Jalio a hand and the two followed the dark elf. As they walk up the stairway, Freyan stopped randomly multiple times when they reached a dead end. Each time he placed his hand on the stone wall and glowing markings appeared in a strange language before the wall disappeared. Where is the library located? Jalioa asked. I am not willing to tell, Freyan replied. It would be wise not to ask again. Do you come here often? Jalioa commented, ignoring the threat. I noticed you used a crystal to teleport us. Interesting trick. The sages of Rondel would be amazed that you have them. I was here when I first learned that the gate appeared, Freyan answered. Before that, I appeared here once in a while. The only time I come here is because I must seek counsel and add or seek knowledge. Does that mean there are others here? Jalioa asked. If you mean if there are other mortals residing here, then no. Interesting choice of words, Lele said. You said, mortals. That means there are other people here. Freyan stopped at a metal door. He placed his hand on it and the door opened, disappearing into the ceiling. Do not touch anything without my permission. And do not get lost. As the three entered the room, all the torches magically ignited as they did in the Roman chamber. Each flame was green, just brightening the chamber just enough to see. What they saw stunned them. Hundreds if not thousands of books, scrolls, and documents are all properly stored inside the strange carved-out bookshelves built into the stone. The dozens of hallways that led away all seemed to go on forever. How big is this place? Jalioa asked. Five times larger than the library at Rondel, Freyan answered. Now, please follow me. As Lele followed, her eyes continued to wander, absorbing all the massive amount of wealth there was around her. It took her boyfriend to grab her arm to calm her down as to how excited she was. Calming her mind as she wondered about all the secrets and knowledge this place must have. Five times larger? If I recall, Rondel had the largest library in the world. 
I know that they think that. How do you maintain the quality of all this knowledge? Jalioa asked. If you are rarely here, ask someone how to maintain them. I have a hive of fairies here, Freyan said. In return for protection, they maintain the library while I am gone. For about fifteen minutes, the three travelled through the maze of books. Until they reached the main chamber. By a table, a green glowing fairy was floating by some scrolls. From the sight, Lele assumed that this was the Hive Queen. I see you have returned, the green fairy said. I was surprised I have not heard from you. I was betrayed, beheaded, and scattered throughout Falmart, Freyan explained. In addition to that, facing off a demon and apostle at war with people from Earth. I see, the green fairy said. Business as usual. Wait, Lele said. Why are you not shocked by what he said? I thought this place was cut off from the rest of the world. Should you be shocked by what he said? Mortals. Why should I be shocked by the information that I already knew? I do not, Lele looked to the apostle for answers. Are you able to see the world from here? Is that how you are able to watch world events? The green fairy laughed. You spend too much time with the Terrans young Lele. We might be on top of the world however, sight is still a sight. I do not dash dot. As Lele was speaking, she felt Jalioa's hand on her shoulder. Do not fall for the fairy's games, Jalioa said. Staring back at the green fairy, realizing that she was being messed with. She remembered what Freyan said about how no mortals reside here. You are the goddess of knowledge? Elange glanced toward the dark elf. You did say she was smart. I warned you, Freyan said. She figured it out faster than I expected. Wheel, I have gained a lot of experience as of late in dealing with gods, Lele said. Before getting to the task at hand, tell me, what are the gods of Earth like? Elange asked, flying closer to Lele. I have never met gods from another world, and I have always wondered if they were just like us. Looking around, seeing all eyes are on her. Lele said, I only met them once. Rory on the other hand has been in constant communication with them about everything when we go to Earth. That is probably because of her apostle status, Freyan commented. They were forced to address the situation when you first arrived on Earth. That is what Rory said, Lele said. To answer your question, while they are more expressive, they are more rigid than our gods. No offense. None was taken, Elange replied. We understand our reputation, which was by design. Now, explain what you mean. I mean, they cut themselves off from the world. Because of that, no one knows that they exist. How fascinating, Freyan commented. It is strange that there are more people who know about their existence on this world than on theirs. That is by design, Lele said. Getting any collaboration from them is living hell. They believe in self-isolation to such a degree that it made me want to pull out my hair. That is silly, Elange said. The mortals need a guiding hand or else chaos reigns supreme. That is why they self-isolated, Lele countered. They felt they were too restrictive. I think their theory became true because of all the advancements in technology. Look how advanced they are, they do not need a gilding hand. At least not to such a direct degree. Not everything is about technology and magic, young one, Elange said. Because they are more advanced does not mean they are healthier. Happier. Connected to their spiritual self. Glancing at the apostle, Lele shot a glare. She realized that he fed Elange information regarding the Terrans. What? Freyan asked. Everything has pros and cons as the Terrans would say. It would be foolish to assume because they flip a switch for light over igniting a torch that they are perfect. Now, a debate like this can happen at another date. We have a task to do. Agreed, Elange said. What brings you all here? Freyan is here to teach me how to better use my magic to stop Vorka, Lele explained what has happened over recent weeks, everything Hardy has done which received a disgusting reaction from Elange. Hardy is always playing her games, Elange commented. Besides, I am surprised Freyan wanted to teach you. From what I understand you have become a powerful mage for your age and race. Yes, Lele said. However, 
as Freyan correctly pointed out, I am young. I have learned many things from my mentor from Earth, Grand High Witch Swordin, and their knowledge from Earth, however, I have learned that I struggle to control my spells and mana. To fight Vorka and the god who merged with him, you need to better control yourself, Freyan said. This could take years, however, there are some things I can teach you now. My goal is to teach you a combination. All right then, Elange said. It is time to begin.